It is a pleasure and an honor to introduce you to Frauke Huber and Uwe Martin. Uh, this is how Frauke describes herself. Maybe we should begin this contribution with a confession, one which, in the context of critical artistic practice, sounds almost offensive. We are journalists. <laughs> Artists then, journalists, researchers, entrepreneurs, they combine a lot and they work slowly, um, which means it takes time. It's very interesting, perhaps also something from the final conversation, how, how we see that, that journalism, good journalism that takes time is now being done more by artists than by journalists themselves. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, they reach a large audience, hundreds of thousands of people, very interesting, and they are part of a very famous club. This is breaking news, so Frau just kind of became a member of the Bombay Flying Club, which is based in Hamburg, and as you can understand, it's a flying club, but actually it's, it's a company of high-profile artists, photographers, who work together and investigate and report on it in film and documentary and photographs. So without much ado, I would love to give the floor to both of you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for having us here as uh, journalists. Um, <laughs> we call ourselves slow journalists and um, what uh, we would like to uh, share with you today um, is a project we have been working on since uh, 2011. But basically it goes back much further. So the Land Rush project was started in 2011, but we are, we are working within agriculture, and our main topic in agriculture and everything around agriculture since 2007, when we investigated cotton production all over the world for six years. And um, so what, what we will be talking about today a little bit is like how we try with our project to bridge, um, to build a bridge from journalism where you have the potential of meeting normal people, right? We, we asked like in the talk before, we hear the question of like, who's the audience, right? Because uh, we can talk here to 30 people or we can try to reach more people. And I think uh, it's important that we do that. And so we, we are journalists by choice and we love to reach many people. But then journalism, as we all know, in many parts is broken, right? I mean, it often oversimplifies things, it makes things easy to understand for, we have this test in journalism. The test is like, tells a story to the cleaning lady, right? If she understands it's a person who cleans your house, then your story is good. And that's, that's a good thing. And we should think about that more in academia and in art, because uh, very often, with uh, languages, we don't reach this cleaning lady or the guy who makes our coffee in the shop because we are too sophisticated. Journalism is doing that quite well, but often loses some of the complexity of our today's world on the way. So with that, we are trying to build this bridge from journalism all the way into other contexts, a context that like we are right in here now, where we are in a room of like really sophisticated people who think about like the big problems in the world and then like how do you talk there and like how does it work in exhibitions and it works different. Um, we're not working always together, we're working for the project together always in the research and later on in the editing process, yeah, with pictures, with text, with the documentary films, but not always on the ground. In some countries we are also to staying staying together four weeks, five weeks, then return in the next year, or how you, how I will explain you later, sometimes also again after five or six, uh, six years. But it's also good when you work as a couple together to be separated maybe for, for five or six weeks when someone is traveling alone to a country to do the research on the ground. And with our projects, we spend minimum two or three months on the ground, not always on the same trip. Minimum normally is four, four weeks on the same trip because we try to get really, really close to our subjects. Yeah. We live with them, 
especially I, um, Uwe is doing often the road trips, yeah, but I'm staying a couple of weeks with my subjects, getting really close, helping them also on the farms, in the house, everything what's going on there, yeah, because only with that I get this intimacy we need for parts of the project, yeah. Uh, okay. um, on our Lamprash project, we've been until now um, to Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, we worked on um, foreign investors, big investors going into the country, renting land for 50 or 99 years for a sm really small amount of money. And we looked there on land grabbing and also on the will willisization problem that tribes were removed because giving the land to the investors. Uh, and we have been um, to um, Central America, to Iowa, to have a look on family farms combining with, with the corn and soy industry and the ethanol production. And one reason for that is, and that's how we work, we build on one, one story, come, brings us to the next. So one of the reasons why it's worse now to go, investors going into Ethiopia is because food prices in 2008 and 11 were going very much up. And so that is why it's worse to go in these far away places. The main driver of that was the production of ethanol and taking away corn from the food cycle. Okay. Actually, we are working in um, Eastern Germany and in Western America, we will talk about this later. In, in Eastern Germany, because of the former DDR, we have real large-scale farms. In Western part of, the, of Germany, it's really small scale. And the land policy in the Eastern part of Germany is really interesting to have a look on it. And the other thing we concentrate there is organic farming because for really uh, sufficient organic farms who are really economically working, uh, it's really hard to rent land because of these land policies. Now we are going over to when, Brazil. When, the, when we were in Africa, it was very interesting, like in Ethiopia, the investors and like the politicians who are inviting all these investors they told us about their dream, and their dream was like, hey, Africa will be the new Brazil. And so we went on to Brazil, to the West, West Brazil, where within 40 years, basically, a huge, diverse ecosystem changed its way totally, and it became one of the most productive uh, farmlands in the world. And uh, so we traveled along the road, so the, it's called the Soy Highway, where all the big farms are, and it pushes away the Amazon rainforest and so on, and pushes this development. People get rich, very rich. Um, they build the middle class, but it's paid by like a total destruction of nature and people getting ill. And um, when we were in Iowa, we talked with uh, we had an interview with one professor and she told us like, well, if you want to see big scale agriculture, you really have to go to California Central Valley because that's like totally man-made basically. I mean, nothing is there like it was. It was like a sea ground, it was desert, it was hills and stuff like that. And now it's like one flat laser, laser leveled factory, farm basically, one big one. Um, and so um, when the drought then started, uh, Oh, during the drought, uh, we went to, uh, West, uh, to California, to the Central Valley, um, and looked at the uh, water policy and uh, changing climate in this um, hydrological society <coughs> of the American West. Um, because the whole society there is only um, possible through, um, through man-made structures. So basically that is like, we talk about Anthropocene, that's like basically one area we can see it very clearly, like how human is involved in every single thing in the landscape. Um, so it started with a drought in California, um, where uh, especially in the last uh, decade, uh, a lot of uh, almond plantations went up, like 85% of all the almonds in the world come from California. Uh, and almonds, like one single almond, takes like four liters of water to grow, one single almond. So stop drinking almond milk, not a good idea. Um, so, uh, and that's in, the, that's in the desert basically, 
So, uh, and the problem is with uh, all these trees is that you need water all the time, right? Um, so, and we are expanding that story right now to the Colorado watershed, and we spend about like the last two years on and off, so spend about seven months in the region uh, talking to many different people. Now let's talk a little bit about like how we reach these people. Uh, uh, how, how do we reach an audience? We're trying to work together with magazines every now and then. We don't go on commission of magazines because then the magazine wants to tell us what to do. And the problem is if you talk to somebody in Hamburg um, on a desk, they will always tell you, oh, there's this big problem of the California drought. You have to photograph this um, golf courses, right? I mean, golf courses in, in, uh, in the desert. And then everybody thinks that's very bad. Well, it is, but on the other hand, 80% of the water is used for agriculture. And like, uh, but a magazine editor in Hamburg uh, is <coughs> closer to the golf course and to the big swimming pool. So they don't understand the agriculture part in that. And so whenever I talk to magazine, they always move us and say like, hey, you, you should look at the golf courses, but that's really not the problem. And the golf course uh, creates so much economic value compared to, let's say, um, a grass farm that is fed by the same water, that if they don't change agriculture in the west of the United States, nothing will change. Um, so, then, so then we go to magazines and we try to sell it to them, like Geo or Cicero or Stern or whatever. After the story is done, not before. Yeah. When we did it in our own way, do our research, staying long on the ground there. And so, I mean, the pictures you are seeing, that is something where it means, like, if you want to work with magazines, there's a certain way of photography that you have to do, because otherwise nobody cares. So, I know, that there, or we know, that there is this big discussion always about, like, the images, that there shouldn't be too signifying. Well, that's a great discussion, and it's very academic. But in, if you want to reach many people, that doesn't work. <coughs> so by choice, we use pictures that are beautiful. We use pictures that lure people in to make them care. And what what happens with that is that through different publications, so we, we had it in different magazines and then in Süddeutsche Zeitung, where we also write the article. Um, with these different publications, um, we um, aim to reach as many people as possible. And let's say we reach with that publication we have potentially half a million people, right? So that is like the readership of this magazines and newspapers that we had it in. So half a million people have the chance to read. If 1% of them, only 1%, is interested in the topic enough to later read a book or go to an exhibition or get more invested into the program and, and, and watch a documentary full-time film, then we reached much more than most exhibitions, most books ever will do in their whole life cycle. And that is what our aim is, right? So that is why we use this type of beautiful photography that looks very much like we had last uh, two weeks ago a comment that was meant as a bad criticism that looks like National Geographic and we were like, yeah, great! <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so, so, that's, so that's the thing. We're trying to, to get people where they are. The other thing we do then is bring the stories online with the magazines together. And in here, you have a kind of like a web documentary where the text and the images that are in the magazine where you can read are, are um, edit, no, what, how do you say it? We add films to it, short films, personal interviews. stories. Interviews. It's going beyond the, the space of the publication you have in a magazine or especially in, an, in, in a newspaper because we have two or three big newspapers in Germany. The Süddeutsche Zeitung is reaching about one million people and then it's, it's really great if you can get online <coughs> with more information. When the people are interested in reading the article in the newspaper, then they have the link there going online and they get more information. And that information then is more complex than what you get in reading an article for 10 or 15 minutes, right? So here you can tell more personal stories or you can... Because there's been so much groundwater pumping, the aquifer system is compacting. And that means the land subsides 
And when the land subsides, it doesn't subside the same everywhere. If this whole valley was subsiding the same, nobody would care. Uh, but the problem is, canals like this are built on very slight gradients because we rely on gravity to move it. So every point upstream has to have a higher elevation than every point downstream for gravity to work. But when you start to lower just part of a canal that's on just a slight gradient, you now have kind of made a hole. And you have to fill up that hole of water with water before it can continue flowing downstream. That can have the effect of overtopping the levees. So they've had to build up the levees uh, and do some other mitigation measures to try to keep the water flowing. Subsidence not only impacts canals, but anything that crosses these areas of differential subsidence, like roads, like railways, like pipelines, all of those kinds of things can, can be impacted. None of them are flexible. So as you're going into an area of subsidence from this, let's say this is not subsiding and this is subsiding, you can see that as this is going down and things are crossing it, if they're not flexible, they're going to break at some point. Right, so this, for example, wasn't in the, in the newspaper because it was just, there was not enough space for that part. Right? And so we're trying, like, in, within this web documentary, all this scrolling, how it's told to, uh, called today, because you scroll through it to get a story told, so it's called scrolling, about the images. A lot of people try to use images, when you use images that are not unsignifying, often what you do with that is that you try to, to do it as if it's a moment that is passing by, that is not a special moment or anything like that. That gives a little bit of feeling of like objective, but it's not objective what we do. So we use pictures and films and the way we shoot is very, very subjective. We are right in the middle of it and we don't want to hide it between an an unsignifying picture because there is no objectivity in photography. I mean, even if you put a camera somewhere, wherever you put it, whatever you choose, like the angle you choose, it's always subjective. And so hiding that behind a layer is not worth it, we think. We think it's great to make beautiful pictures that are obviously subjective and then people can ask us why, there are, why we shoot them the way we do. But for every viewer, it's directly up directly clear that that is a subjective image. Um, in 2013, because of a, a big exhibition coming up at the beginning of 2014 in Dortmund with the World of Matter Group, we are talking about the group later, um, we were thinking about our project to be presented in the exhibition. We don't only to want to have uh, projections, big projections and, and uh, screens where you can sit down with headphones and get um, the intense information. The projections were just to lure people in. Normally they are running between three minutes and, uh, and six minutes and we thought, okay, we want to have the viewer also as maybe his, his own reporter that he can make decisions. That is, we, we brought then the stories uh, to an iPad app, native iPad app, um, where a great programmer and designer in Denmark helped us to develop. And I will show you now his uh, iPad app. It's, it's running now since three years in the exhibition. At the moment we have three countries on it, Ethiopia, um, Iowa and uh, Brazil. The next one, California drought will come in, Eastern Germany will come. And in a couple of weeks, it's also that we will bring this app uh, out of the exhibition into the Apple iPad store, that everybody who wants to buy the app can buy it. Yeah. And just show you a little bit how the app is working now. You can go left or right. You can choose the countries you want to have a look on. Then you can go inside here, and it's a mixture of short films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And we have no sound when we have the pictures or text that you can concentrate on this. We have video moments. They are in a loop. They are normally 30 seconds or something like this. And we have interviews with the different subjects and protagonists. And we have short films in it. And you can stop wherever you are. But and you can make a telephone call in between, or you can switch to the other country to have a look there. When you're going back, you're the, at the, the government same point was importing food as you've been before. And every every story, every country, if you want to see all the short films, the interviews, to read the text, is about half an hour. And for us, it's really interesting that you heard of the, the people in the exhibition who organize the exhibitions, that people sit really down. We have normally real nice sofas and a table with the iPads there. And some stay there for, for one and a half hour to look at all three stories. Or they come back to the exhibition to see the next country maybe two weeks later or something like this. And that's really interesting for us. We are always interested in the feedback from the visitors. Yeah, we also go to the museum, stay there, or the galleries for a couple of hours and ask the people about their experience, what we can do better, because that's also we want to reach uh, the audience. Yeah? And uh, in the iPad app, everybody of our subjects get enough room. We have the conventional, traditional Iowa farmer from the Midwest. We have maybe someone from the seed company, the CEO. You just saw the CEO, Ramakrishna Karaturi, from this 1,000 hectare farm in Ethiopia. But we also have the people from the tribes there. We have the organic farmer. We have the, an activist in there. <coughs> and everybody gets his space. Yeah? We have our own opinion about the subject, but we try that the the visitor, um, the viewer, can make up his own mind. Yeah? And I just want to show you a little bit of a small movie. When you get the trust of the people then, and live with them, that is also pos possible. Yeah? Um, to get close to people who are not so well connected as I'm from Germany, I'm from the city, yeah. but spending a couple of weeks with Iowa farmers, then they started trusted me and they started uh, to allow me to do pictures, to take sound, to videotape them, yeah, because they had the feeling that uh, they will be, with their opinions, also be represented well in, in um, in our documentary or however you will call it, yeah, because a lot of them had really bad experience with, with normal media. The, the colleagues came in for one or two days or maybe for a couple of hours and then they don't feel represented after that in their article or so. Yeah. And I think that's also one thing, if, if you're a journalist or an artist, you have to spend time with people you want to reach, who are far away from, from your uh, normal friends and, and uh, culture. So, um, there is another way of, saying, of, of telling our story. So, like from that bridge that we start building, is like you have 15 minutes you need to read one story in a magazine, in a newspaper. You need about 30 minutes to go through one chapter in the iPad app. You have three, you can connect the different stories, you get this feeling of like being involved into a universe of like different connectivity between different yeah. stories. And then you have the possibility to go to an exhibition. And in an exhibition what we do is we're trying to do fragmented narratives where instead of presenting a linear documentary movie where you assign certain roles to certain people to bring across your story, like you would always have, let's say, 
the farmer, and then you have like the environmentalist, and the farmer gets this three sentence, and the environmentalist gets like two sentences, and the best two sentences that are the most pushing the story forward, which always means creating conflict, right? I mean, you want to have a story with conflict because otherwise it's boring, right? So you create this conflict in the story, um, gives its best sentences, and then you have another three sentences of the farmer again, and then let's say the politician talks a little bit and whatever. And so you go through a documentary movie. Uh, and that is very good. It's basically our research, like what we learned as journalists. We take you by the hand and show you what we learned. What we do in exhibitions is a little very different. We present longer, short films, longer interviews. Let's say if we do an interview of like an hour or two with one farmer, then you will find maybe 10 minutes of that interview there. So it's much more like on a conversation, like when you're sitting together on a table, right? So you have like the farmer here, you listen to that person for like 10 minutes or something, and you listen to like the guy from Greenpeace here for like another eight minutes. And then comes like the guy from the seed company and talks to you. And when you do it like that, when you sit down and listen to these monitors, like here, like you have like the big pictures that are there to draw you in into the situation. You have the sound of the place to be involved in that. And then you sit down and you, you can listen to all the different stakeholders. And here's their argument. And what happens when you listen to one person one by one? then very often it is not down to the shouting match that we hear so many times in like, uh, like programs in the evening, right? Or like, like, this, like highly condensed documentaries. But you can listen to arguments. And so that is our aim with this kind of stuff. Let's uh, see how that, let's look into a few of them. They call this country high mountain desert. Well, it is, but we have access to irrigation. All these meadows are what we call flood irrigated. And we just turn large amounts of water out across these meadows simply because we're irrigating old time gravel beds. The good thing about that is be once we can get that gravel full, then we can make that water travel long distances out, out across these meadows. But until we get that gravel full in the early spring, we can't accomplish much on the surface. And everybody thinks that's really bad. But to me, that, that cobble under there that we're filling up with water early in the spring is almost like an underground reservoir. And as the season progresses, that water starts draining out of this aquifer and it runs back to the river and it supplements the river all summer, late summer and into the fall. Down the lane on two. If we were forced to change our irrigation system and be forced to go to sprinklers, you wouldn't have those return flows coming back to the river. And I think there'd be a great impact upon other parts of our economy in the county. Uh, we wouldn't have the water for fishing that we do now. We wouldn't have the water for rafting and kayaking. And the whole riparian ecosystem would change. time together like being in the mountains and so on and so forth and a lot of people blame him for using too much water for just grass right? I mean grass is basically economically the worst thing you can put water on but then it's it's then on the other hand he's probably one of the largest environmentalists in the region because he just put an, uh, an easement on all his land that will forever put it into agriculture and remove it from the development there. Otherwise, you have like big ski parks, a lot of tourism, you have huge uh, 
um, houses of like rich people and stuff like that that all wants to be there. It's like very close to Aspen. So like land, rise, land prices there are super high. He could be a multimillionaire. He makes about $60,000 a year. That's what he lives on. He could be a millionaire easily, but he puts like all that because he wants to preserve this agriculture. So what, what we are interested in is like having this, this, this complex stories where you don't know, like it's so easy to point your finger to a farmer and say like, hey, you are a bad guy, right? And that is what ha what's happening so much in the whole thing. It's like that the people who are caring about the environment, often from the cities, they don't talk to the farmers. The farmers think, oh, those tree-hugging idiots, right? They have no idea. Um, and, and think that they are preserving their land to the best of their knowledge. If they would be talking more, then that would probably have very good effects for all of them. And so that is what, what we are trying with the project, to, to bring those different people together. So let's look into another one. So this is uh, Peter Glick from the Pacific Institute. We've reached the limits of new supply. We've tapped all the big rivers. We've built all the, on all the good dam sites. We're over tapping our groundwater. The idea that we could find more supply in California as an answer to our water problems is a 20th century way of thinking. We can't do that. We've reached what, what we call peak water in California. But the real issue there is how much water are we promising agriculture? If we promise agriculture the average amount of water we get hydrologically every year, then we have a problem during droughts when there isn't enough water, when there isn't an average amount of water. Uh, we have to rethink the way we promise water to farmers and we have to rethink the water rights that have been given away to farmers. In addition, we sometimes hear that the drought is caused by Congress, or the drought is caused by politicians, or the drought is caused by our attempts to restore some water flows for ecosystems. That, that's, of course, nonsense. The drought is a natural phenomenon. Congress has no influence over how much water nature delivers. And the truth is, Congress has no influence on how much water is delivered to senior junior water rights holders. Those are laws that have been set up over the last hundred years. Um, and we restore only a tiny amount of water for natural ecosystems. Uh, is it appropriate to let fish species go extinct in order to grow a few more acres of some of the low-valued crops that we grow in California or even the high-valued crops? We have to figure out how to have a good agricultural economy and protect the natural environment at the same time. When we think about water, it's connected to everything we care about. It's connected to food. It's connected to ecosystems and, and human health. It's connected to industry and economic productivity. It's connected to climate change. It's connected to energy. Water is, in many ways, the world's most important resource because it ties everything together. And if we can't solve our water problems, we're not going to solve any of the other environmental problems that we face. These exhibitions are part, partly now, some, some are like our own exhibitions, but we got into this exhibition thing basically by accident. Um, we were in uh, Burkina Faso uh, doing a part of our cotton documentary, and there, uh, on the, there was a Biennale in Bamako, uh, and we met Ursula Bima. And uh, because we have been working with this Bombay Flying Club thing, that's like a collective of storytellers that, that we do stuff for the, for the net, like we do web documentaries, and. Uh, so as we had some experience with that, Ursula invited us to, to uh, say like, hey, let's, let's talk about that. We are both working on resources. Uh, we have very different ways of looking at it. And so let's, let's think if we can do something together. And then we started a, program, a, a project called World of Matter. I give you the catalog. You can pass it around. I don't know if you have maybe heard of it uh, before. Um, and that is a um, project that brings many different people from many different fields together. So Ursula Beeman is like a video artist um, working on this really complex... Oh, we have seen in the first keynote of yeah. like uh, uh, TJ Demos, uh, we saw some of that. And there is uh, Lonnie van Brommelen and Sibren de Haan, they are uh, artists from uh, the Netherlands. Um, they work a lot with uh, installations, with, uh, with monuments, with video art, we'll see some later. Um, 
uh, there's uh, Marvel Petonico, she's an artist and a professor from Brazil. Uh, we have Paulo Tavares, who's a, a scholar and an architect who's at the Goldsmiths College, but also Brazilian. So, a uh, few other people. So, uh, researchers, architects, um, um, help me, Peter. Art historian. Uh, yeah, Research an art historian. Peter Kelder. Yeah, so it's a big group of people, and we all come from very different backgrounds, right? I mean, we are the journalists there, then you have like all these different types of people who, are, who have different ways of thinking. And what was very interesting in the course of this project that we started in 2010 and then in 2013 came out our webpage and the book came out in 2014 or 15, I believe. Um, what was very interesting there is how did you work together with different fields, with different people from like many different disciplines? Um, that have different value systems, that have different ways of languages that they communicate with each other, right? I mean, we use a very simple language. We don't use bigly, but simple language, right? So, um, but, but then we have like very sophisticated people in there who use language that we didn't understand in the first three meetings we had. We were always sitting there, and I think it was interesting for everybody when we said, hey, wait, what do you mean? By that word. And then you start a conversation there. And um, the other thing, what we, had, for example, had, um, and, and that is something I think is very telling, like once you start um, doing this, um, this, this project with many different disciplines, how is, the, how, how is the award system within each industry, right? So if you're in academia, it's great to present a paper at a conference. And some people even pay to present papers at conferences. Because if you present so many papers and so on and so forth, you get a nice professor position, you get more money and so on and so forth, you can live very well. And so for you, it's great as academics, it is great to present a lot of paper and create a lot of content, and give it out for free. So we had a discussion, should, and in an, idea, in an ideal world, we would love to do that. Should all our content be public domain, which academics love, right? Public domain is great. You can use all my pictures, everything's good. But well, nobody pays me. Nobody pays Frauke, right? We cannot pay our thing because we don't have a professor position. We don't get anything from, uh, from presenting at a conference unless they pay us. Um, so we need to sell our picture and keep this copyright. And that's a bad thing for many people, right? This is like corporate, copyright, bad thing. Right, so, so how do you do that in a project, right? When some people get paid by a system that is working and some others have to get their money by selling the story to things, like making it exclusive. And then the other thing is like, exclusivity is like, what was very interesting is, we had an exhibition in Dortmund, where Dortmund is like, you know, it's like old uh, uh, steel towns, coal, and stuff like that. So a lot of very normal people come to this exhibition in Dortmund. We have hundreds and hundreds of visitors in our World of Matter exhibition. And then a lot of our group was really dis, uh, not super happy with it, with the crowd, because it didn't draw, it draw the right people. So it was just like normal people. And they were like some way a little bit disappointed that not, let's say, Bruno Latour came to me. Right? So you, you wish you would have somebody famous in there. We didn't. We have, but we have hundreds of people visiting it over weeks and weeks. Then there was another event where we both were really disappointed when we showed our website. There were 30, 40 people in the audience. In Brussels. Yeah. In Brussels, in Argos. We had been working on that stupid website, which you will the shortly see. Meta website. The World of Meta website for two years. And it was a really hard process. There were 30, 40 people. And then we were like, oh gosh, right, nobody has seen it. It's so bad. And like everybody else, like all the academics were very happy because a few important French philosophers had sent their assistance. And then we thought, like, yeah, okay, so it's like different value systems, right? And, and that is something you have to discuss in the vision. And it's very important. I mean, I understand the beauty of both, but it is important to discuss that. Who do you want to reach and how do you do it? Okay, so going back to this idea of like, who do you reach with what kind of 
content and, and, and stories. 15 minute reading for a magazine, about half an hour in the iPad app. People spend two and a half hours in this exhibition. Two and a half hours, that's really like reading, no, not half a book, but at least a nice big chapter. Es el mundo de nosotros, es la naturaleza de nosotros venir a pescar aquí cada año. No nos importa si ganemos o perdemos, aquí vamos a estar. Porque vamos a seguir luchando por ser y por estar aquí. Como una mujer pescadora que soy, una mujer guerrera, luchadora, eh, que lucho por dejarle mis tradiciones a mis hijos, que, que les inculco que no dejen que se terminen, que sigan luchando como indios cucapás que somos, como pescadores que somos ancestralmente. Eh, nuestro hermano del río Colorado ya se acabó. En el río Colorado pescamos todo el año y hoy ya no, porque ya no hay agua, ya se están muriendo, ya se murió prácticamente todo. Lo único que hay en el río Colorado son las aguas de los riegos que llegan, de las parcelas, ya no hay pescado, ya no hay varias especies de pájaros, ya no hay muchos, qué se le pueden decir, hierbas, matas, ya no hay. Las que venían con el río Colorado ya no están sobreviviendo, como al igual. Si el gobierno no nos da agua, el río Colorado, al igual que toda la fauna, y al igual vamos a morir también nosotros. O sea, el río Colorado lo ocupamos como ocupamos el latido del corazón, la sangre que vamos en las venas. Ocupamos el pescado que viene ahí para que toda mi gente pueda comer, para que toda mi nación pueda comer, que es la nación Cucapá. So these are the Kukapa um, Indians at the uh, in the Colorado Delta, which in the Colorado doesn't reach uh, the sea for many decades now, since the 1960s <coughs> on and off, and since the late 1990s, not at all. Um, and so basically this whole ecosystem, which used to be probably the most diverse ecosystem in all of North America, died. Uh, and it's like it's like a huge wasteland now. And, uh, so, um, and that has to do uh, with, with like water rights. So we are looking at like all the water rights and how the water gets distributed through all these different uh, stakeholders along the Colorado River. Um, and, uh, and, and what what's happened with this? Well, and a thing that might be, di that is different in our project from many projects that we have seen of the time from, from other artists and from journalists, very often people are working on one project, right? Then you have your project, you do an exhibition, it's great, you, you theorize it, and then it's done. We cannot work like that. We are working, like our project is a little bit like a coral reef. It's like slowly growing and it builds new trajectories all the time. So it's like a constant cycle of like research, um, production, um, on the ground, uh, uh, filming and presentation. Then we start the cycle all over again and it constantly grows. Uh, for one example, uh, this year we will go back to Ethiopia after five years to have a look again on this big farm because there are a lot of rumors. Oh, there's a lot of rumors that the big farm uh, in Ethiopia is failed. Yeah, we got information about on Facebook, some in the press, and we will go back again, have a look and then we will update this capital, uh, this part of the iPad app. Yeah. So yeah, so so this project keep on going and we, we try to keep on this long look because if you only go for one moment in time now, you miss out so much development, right? Because the easiest thing to go to do is to go in Africa to this big farm of this Indian investor and the first thing most people do is they photograph the children that are working there. And then go, oh, bad guy, children working, that's bad, bad company. And you can easily write a nice article about the bad Indian company using child labor. Well, that's true to a certain extent, but it falls very short of the whole story. So um, if you want to see, really see what, what it means, it is important to return to the same people who hated the investors in the same village 
um, when we visited the first time, a few months later when we came the second time, said, ah, after all they're not so bad, they gave us a little generator and things like that. Well, they still destroyed their forest and so on and so forth, but people are changing their perspective. Well, right now the investor is probably bankrupt or everything is in, 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 in ruin there, and so probably the, it has changed again. Very likely it has changed again. Um, and so we, what, what we are trying to do is going on the ground long enough so that we can change our knowledge. I mean, that is a, the aim of the whole project. It's not to show what we have researched before, like many journalists are doing and many, many artists are doing. Like you have a great idea, you read a bunch of books, you make a great concept and you go there, work with people for three days, film them, come back, edit your stuff for six months, put it to an exhibition and call it a collaboration with the people, mm. right? That is not a collaboration. That's a great artist project, but it has nothing to do with a collaboration. We don't collaborate with people. What we do there is our pictures. We do our view of the thing, but we spend two months with them. Frauke uh, works with them, like bringing pigs, <laughs> or like, like delivering pigs, right? Cooking dinner for the families, living with the people. But we would never call it a collaboration because in the end, it's the pictures that we do. So is it a collaboration? We learn from people, but it's not that they have a say of what we tell about them. It's always our view. So um, this is a, a part of the um, World of Matter exhibition, how it looked like in Dortmund, the first one. Now let's go over to another thing, and that's uh, the World of Matter website, where um, we connect our project to many other projects of, uh, of the artists of World of Matter. So when you come to the World of Matter webpage, hey, who, who of you has, has been on the World of Matter webpage? Okay, it's yes, quite a crowd. <laughs> it's the biggest crowd ever. <laughs> really, a million people I can see, and maybe one and a half. <laughs> uh, so, no, true, right? Our crowd is bigger than yours, right? <laughs> no, anyway. So, um, so when you come to the World of Matter webpage, um, you're you're faced with this with this uh, chaos, right? Uh, there's many moments that you could go into. So let's, uh, you can go to, like each of these things that you see here are clusters. Each cluster is kind of a story or like one project of an artist. And uh, let's say we, we would start here at this Brazilian um, cluster. Because Lonnie van, uh, um, Lonnie van Brummelen and Sebrin de Haan from our group they do really collaborations with the people. They did a great story on the Urk fishermen here in, in the Netherlands, and they worked with them for two years, and that's really a collaboration because also the Urk fishermen then are producers of the documentary film Sea Change, um, what um, comes out of it. Yeah, and now they're at the moment, to, since two years, they're working on a project in Suriname, and it's also real cooperation, uh, collaboration with the people on the ground. How do people, do you show your work to people in the countries that you've made things about? And yeah, we how, do. And if they, so how do they react? Oh, um, it's really interesting. I, I just picked up the example with the farmers in Iowa because they like the iPad app, they like that, um, how they are represented, but Taiwan, uh, in, uh, they got really angry about the organic farmer, what he is telling, or maybe the professor who is talking about resiliency. But at the end, they are telling us, oh, for us it's great, and we will buy the app, and we will also tell our neighbor farmers that they have to buy it, because that's the first time we, we can sit down on our couch and have a look on the other opinions on agriculture. Yeah? And as long as they are feeling their part represents themselves, they are looking at the other parts. They spend also one and a half hour looking through the whole app, also to the other countries. 
And that's the thing we want to reach, that they don't block because they say to us, okay, no, we don't read Washington Post, we don't read New York Times because what's in there about agriculture is all lies. Yeah? <laughs> that's the thing we hear in the Midwest. Yeah? And, and we just think, okay, we have to, to, maybe there's a small chance to break some boundaries between the city people and, and the countryside um, with, with projects like this, yeah, because if they find themselves good representative, maybe they, they have a look on the other things too, yeah, and they start thinking. Yeah, we had also big talks about Obamacare, and I went out uh, in the countryside and do photography and filming, and then farmers from a region from 50 kilometers stop. Oh, you are the photographer who's working with them, and you like Obamacare. Can you please tell us why you like Obamacare? And I think that's absolutely necessary to get in, in touch with the people yeah, who have so different opinions as I have, yeah, because I like Obamacare. <laughs> okay, so I hope internet is working now. So, uh, for example, let's start here. That's a cluster uh, about uh, Brazil. So here you would have like a, a, a one short film, and then you see you can go uh, to the next media. So that brings you, if you see here, I think this has this funky nasal pointer thing. Right? Ah. <laughs> okay, here you have like, you, you can see how many uh, small stories are in here. So that's a, a, a nearly eight minute film about uh, an indigenous uh, a group in the, Amazon that are pushed aside and what they think about this new road and so on and so forth. So you could go through that and follow our project about uh, Brazil, but you also have the possibility here to um, go up here. You see there's a related media, the rights of nature. So when you go up here, you come to a project by Paulo Tavares that is um, about non-human rights. And um, you can read his um, articles here, and you can print it out if you want. Um, go on, that's two. Right. So that's the work of Paulo Tavares. And here um, you have another. Um, Diversion, another, how do you call it, like another crossroad, <laughs> another crossroad, where you could um, go um, to um, the Black Sea files of Ursula Biemann that is looking at the Caspian uh, oil pipeline project, right? Uh, the Caspian Sea, and um, uh, discusses uh, many different things, uh, like the Kurdish worker camp, uh, prostitutes that are along that way, um, scientists that are talking about activists and so on and so forth. But then here again, you have a possibility to go over and connect so, uh, to the Monument of Sugar by uh, Lonnie Van Brummelen and C. Brindian. They followed um, the, the sugar industry and uh, basically the trade of sugar and how sugar is not allowed to come into the European Union but subsidized to go out. And so they, so they created a big monument of sugar and art piece that they imported back from Nigeria to the European Union. And they had to make it an art piece because you can not, the, the um, taxes on sugar would be so high that you cannot import sugar into the EU, but uh, the artwork can be exported. So um, they could easily import an artwork, but then they got trouble uh, in Kenya because um, Kenya doesn't want, uh, Kenya, Nigeria, sorry, they don't uh, permit uh, any cultural things to be exported to not be robbed. So basically they had problems there that, that sugar suddenly was an artwork. And so um, it gives a very, it's a very, very interesting, uh, <coughs> a complex project about like trade policy and things like that. And then uh, you go on to the fishermen in Burg that, uh, that lost their land basically um, when, when this dam was constructed. They, they got their, there, there was a big dam constructed and, and the whole land fell dry and people expected them to become farmers because suddenly they didn't have like room to the, to the sea anymore and then they just built bigger boats. 
Um, and so uh, here's another way of like how the project is working is like totally different from how we work, for example. Okay, I'll stop it here. What is great about this project, you really have to see it. Episodes of the Sea, Lani van Brommel and Sieper in the Han. Um, they spent two or three years with the fishermen, with the fishing community there. Record, like wrote down all the interviews they did with them. Like for three years, they talked with them, and then they started to edit them into a theater play, and wanted to give to us as people because the fishermen of Ulm they have a tradition of like uh, amateur theater. So they then they wanted to do this piece of real theater, like of things that people said. And then they bring it to the community and present it to them and say, no, no, you cannot do it like this. And then they started to become co-authors and changed the project completely. And then they filmed it. So it's a very different approach, right? It's like a total different practice. And so, okay, so, right? So you see, like, there was many different projects, like very philosophical questions. Um, you have this, this very playful, um, very media-reflective project. Well, if you look to the overview now, um, here are all the clusters that are in World of Matter right now, it's growing. Um, and what you see here is the trail that we went, right? Mm. What you can do with it, you can download it. Now let's go to education. Just think uh, how geography classes, or politics classes, or things that were in the old days, right? You had like this book. And then you learned about like what is the longest river and so on and so forth. But let's say I'm a teacher in a class, uh, I don't know, 10th grade, 12th grade, something like that. And you give people and say, hey, start at the beginning. Go 20 steps, whatever you are interested in. If you're interested in water, if you're interested in land, if you're interested in oil, whatever. Go 20 steps, write them down, and write your paper, your, your paper about that you would get 20 totally different views of the world, 20 different um, ways of producing knowledge that is driven by the people. So they create their own knowledge through that. So that was one idea of trying to create a tool, a system of raw files that people can use to make new connections. Um, you can also have look here it's like where all the projects are right so here you can see what they are about but it has another um, area here where you can uh, look for different clusters but also it's an archive so you can also go for um, keywords Eine Minute? Oh. Eine Minute, bitte. Eine Minute. <laughs> yes I will <laughs> You hear what once it's German, it sounds much more clear. Jetzt bitte. Jetzt bitte. Schnell, schnell. So let's show the result. So uh, these are stories that have to do with borders. Anyway, you get the idea. It's like a traditional archive and so on and so forth. So. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, at some point, over you said um, you take uh, people by the hand, which is etymologically speaking the original meaning of pedagogy. 
of, of pedagogy to take some right by the hand to lead, right. right? So if you if you talk about yourselves as journalists, is that kind of journalism in the sense of giving information or are you actually what doing education, let's say, the material can be used in education, is this kind of also yeah, a pedagogical project in a sense? Well, I think, yeah, of course. I mean, John, I think that the role of journalism basically is a role of a translator. Mm -hmm. So as journalists, we are talking to experts, right? I'm talking to an, a professor of, uh, of water issues, right? We are going there to talk to the Kukapa Indians who have certain knowledge. They have so much more knowledge than we have. And we, through getting into the project, get more knowledge than the people we want to talk to have. So basically, we are trying to build to build this bridge to do this translation be between the experts and the people who don't know anything. And that is, of course, journalism is pedagogy. I mean, yes. I mean, partly, but not. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, no, I, I, mean, I don't know what you think. Is it pedagogy to to prove? prove and also, I was actually happy that you talked about copyright of images, not because of copyright, but the issue of uh, sustaining a practice. Yeah, how do you sustain a practice? Because immediately when I was thinking about the fact that you, you brought in the comparison between, let's say, the journalist who works for AP or New York Times, yeah, they can't usually say, you know, I think I'm going to subsidize two months living out and so and so and then go back to the newspaper and hope they buy my story yeah so what i would be curious to know is actually more about your economic structure are you in a, and i mean this in the most polite sense yeah but are you hijacking, <laughs> use are you hijacking funding from arts and culture so grants and things like that and i mean like again i'm saying this is positive because it's a means of channeling attention so i'm not being critical about that but more just trying to talk about what are the economic systems that are sustainable, mm -hmm. yeah. but also that are sustaining that very attention that journalists can't, right? They don't have that economic structure to have sustained attention. Oh, we always talk when we have uh, colleagues from journalism or students there about the economic structure because that's essential and we <laughs> want to, to show the younger people that you can do long-term projects and you can uh, if you use different uh, systems, you can live from that. Yeah, it's not a rich living. Yeah, but it's okay. Yeah, we, we are fine. With this. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, we talked about it as we selling it uh, to magazines and newspapers, and the example we had was uh, the magazine who offered us the most, who get it first. Yeah. And then the Süddeutsche Zeitung, the newspaper, get it second, they pay less. And then we had one more uh, magazine who, who get it third, yeah. And I think we also had it, could sell our stories more European-wide. We're not so good at selling because then the next money came in and we start again going to the ground to, do, to start the next research. We also get funding, uh, not till now, not from from art funding, but from film funds and from, from photography. We got grants, yeah, because there are also photography grants out there, yeah. And sometimes research grants, yeah, you get because in Germany it's that uh, the professions of uh, film, photography, and writing, because of all these multimedia stuff, is going more together. That means you can apply to different funds. That's really good for all three disciplines of us. And the other thing is, Uwe is really good in teaching. He loves teaching. There's also income. And I do some, um, because I have the photography background, some poetry stuff for smaller companies. There's also or also some event stuff. Yeah, there's also money coming in. Thanks. It's I mean, it's really helpful to kind of move beyond the kind of volunteerism economy and to hear how you sustain the practice. So what, what's the price of the app? Oh, okay. So that comes next. Let, let me let me just uh, 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 add to that. So basically, how the situation is in the moment is that this project uh, is self-sufficient. That means it brings in enough money to go and do it and spend months on the ground and do all of that and produce the app. But it's not paying our rent. The rent is paid by teaching and photography jobs. 
So we are subsidizing the project basically um, with our time. But on the other hand, that totally okay. I mean, it would be nicer to have more. So what's coming up next is that we have this app that will go to the app store and uh, it will be 12 euros, so 11.99. It's always this 99 with Apple. <laughs> um, you can't make 12 euros. It's, it's forbidden from Apple. You have these 99. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Anyway, so we go to the mighty Apple and that's okay, 11.99. And then um, and you keep 70% of that, it will keep 30. And one, one interesting thing with this dying media market, um, when uh, to just give you some figures, if you do a big story for uh, Geo magazine, which is, I don't know if you know it, it's uh, like a small version of National Geographic in Germany, um, five, four years, four years ago, uh, the cotton story was in there and uh, they paid 12,000 euro for it. Um, that was uh, a, a tiny friction of what we what we paid to do the story, but at least it was twelve thousand. Now with the Colorado story that we spent eight months on doing, they only pay six thousand. That was like fighting like crazy, and like we are always fighting like crazy. So they pay only six thousand anymore because they dropped a lot in readership, so they don't have more money. You said to spend it to us. Um, but, and that is the interesting thing for us now, and that is like the shifting media landscape. What we deal now with magazines is we want their eyeballs. Before, the struct like the idea of a media company was always to sell readers to advertisers, right? I mean, you, you get the magazine, you pay with your attention, you go to Coca-Cola, whatever ad, and, and you get a nice sip and everybody's happy, right? So that, doesn't, that model doesn't work anymore, so because not enough. Uh, money comes in from that. So now our idea is that we give the story a little cheaper than what it costs to produce, but therefore we use the half million people that Geo reaches in promoting our app. So um, they will, we have a deal with them now that they will use their mailing list, their Facebook, their Twitter, whatever. And to, also the magazine on. And, and in the magazine article, we get a little bit um, to to sell our app to say like, hey, that's a large, that's part of a larger project, and here's the link to that. We have no idea how that works. What we hope is that of this half a million people, let's say maybe five hundred or a thousand are buying it, and then we are okay. Right? So it's it's like it's like we we have to shift, and it's like the the whole thing is like in in. And flux in the moment, so you don't know. It's like changing, and you just have to make the best out of it. And I suppose, kind of like the relationship sometimes to investigative long term journalism. There's um, a journalist, for example, called Ian Avina, who works for the New York Times, and he's been following the slave trade in Thailand and has been um, also lobbying for like more protection for uh, these men who are being kidnapped and then. <coughs> being put onto these sort of train, uh, ships. And um, I was just thinking, because I, I don't sense that you have, um, uh, in order to maintain your impartiality, that you don't have um, some activist lobbying aspect of your project. And it might be that you're connected in ways to other organizations and groups who might use your material and use your consultancy. But I was just wondering if you could speak a bit more about that because there must be a temptation at some point to work with these people to better their situations as you go over the years. Yeah, it's a it's a big argument always. I think when you get involved into any kind of journalism for a long time and it's it's type it's it's something where um, people's rights are affected, their livelihood is affected, you become a kind of an activist automatically because you are human, right? So you have to, and we are as well. But what I think is, like all of the things we have shown you now, and most of what is part of this Land Rush project in the moment, um, we think that giving out the information is key. We are not good organizers. And for example, for the issue of like land grabbing, there are a lot of organizations out there that are doing work on that. So um, our role is not to become another NGO. Um, 
but we would be open working together or with some if it's not becoming pure propaganda. Um, or, and that, that is one big thing, we, we have been in contact with a big um, foundation um, that politically would have been right in our ballpark and we wanted to talk with them, but then they wanted to own the project. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to give us 85,000 euros and then they wanted to uh, they wanted to force us to um, how do how do you say it? we wouldn't be free to choose other partners anymore. We would have any other partner. We would have to talk with them to bring on board. Well, it's very clear we don't bring in Monsanto or Bayer or something like that on board. We could make good money with this kind of stuff from Syngenta, Bayer, Monsanto. They would love it. Um, a lot of the images. We don't do that. But we don't never give up our project in a way that we give it to an environmental uh, organization who then can say, oh, you have to talk to this kind of people. And that was from the Green Party, an organization from the Green Party. And they wanted us to, 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 to not even like be able to talk to many other people. And that, that is just like a big fuck you. Yeah, and, 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 and also <laughs> a big problem is when you get too close to an NGO, I work in, in my commercial work, and it's commercial work, I work for Greenpeace. And I'm, I think I'm, since I'm 18, I'm a, member of, I'm a member of Greenpeace, yeah? But I always make clear with the projects uh, that we are not connected to one party, because the farmers in the mid Midwest, they hate Greenpeace, yeah? You have, if you want to have all sides in your projects, yeah? Then you get in real trouble when you're connected to yeah, too close to activist groups, yeah, and Greenpeace is an activist group, yeah. Yes. And, and there you have to, to sometimes separate your private opinions, yeah, and what you are fighting for maybe in your private with, with, um, with your project, yeah. It's, your project is still subjective, but when you want to get in contact with the other side, you have to be careful, yeah. Um, not to be um, yeah, yourself an activist, you have to decide then. Yeah. Well, it's in flux, right? We don't know exactly. We will see what comes up. There are things we would work with, and there are things we don't work with. And I'm, everybody, I'm going to have to yeah. stop you here. I, one sentence and then All I right. finish. One, one sentence. <laughs> um, right here on the web page, you can see who funded us and what are the policies of each fund. So we make it open. Just yes. one thing, uh, because Syngenta has this, this big, big photography art award, and a lot of colleagues who are working in, in the environmental thing, they applied for this. But Syngenta is one of the, the companies we would never apply ever for, for something for their money, because it's, how do you say, it's confronting with our project. Yeah, yeah it would co totally compromise yeah. whatever we do. I mean, it's like impossible to do yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your practice and your ethical concerns with us. Let's give one last round of applause.